everybody. I hope I pronounced it correctly, which means hello in Estonian. Um, my name is Istvan Nagy. I'm coming from G Hardcore in Hungary. And I would like to talk about the deep learning uh, and big data analytics in healthcare. Uh, why is it important? Uh, because, first of all, uh, it's a big topic to, to cover it with. And uh, thanks to the uh, speakers earlier today, uh, I was pretty impressed by the analysts. So I would like to <laughs> come up with a speed as well. Um, our research is basically funded by the Hungarian government. So at the top, you, you could also see the Hungarian uh, agent of 2020 where our project was uh, founded. And thanks to the top conf, we can also uh, uh, present you what we achieved. Uh, a small background of myself. Um, I have technical consultancy background on several blue chips clients, including Lufthansa, uh, British Telecom, uh, Commerce Bank, Vodafone, Telecom, and Deutsche Börse itself. Uh, with more than about 70 years experience. So if you have any questions regarding this kind of companies, uh, not to disturb the NDA, please ask after the session. And uh, when I got back from Germany in 2011, I started working with Canon also for, as a research team lead, and we did a kind of a photo management system similar to Flickr or Google Photos, where we introduced a kind of an auto-tagging feature based on deep learning. And there is a, that was the introduction where I put into the big data world and deep learning itself. Where we, uh, where we try to use and try to uh, make it work. And uh, afterwards, uh, I started working by G Healthcare last year, um, where we had an opportunity to make it, let's say, more serious things like medical niche processing. Um, I would like to have a uh, question for you. Uh, how many of you do know anything about medicine? Or <laughs> oh, cool, thanks. Go on. Uh, about image processing in general? Wow, very good, very good. Um, so basically it's combining the both. <laughs> and not to forget, uh, it's also about uh, finding new ways on doing it. Uh, they're really cool on, on what they do on image processing in a classical ma manner, like doing hue transformation, fast fuel transformation, and all kind of transformation, and Gabor filtering, and so on. But it's also have to find out how it can work on large scale. Why I'm saying it, and that is basically the agenda I would like to talk about. Uh, what is about big data in healthcare? What what are the trends and current current challenges we have to face with? Uh, what is deep learning, or how we can apply deep learning for medical image processing? And how we applied for deep learning? We had two projects. Um, guess what? Uh, the guys there were pretty for the series. Regions is not a not an existing one, but Fox did uh, both as a series, so we do, took the name of that. The first one is basically anatomy region detection. The second one is uh, detecting bones and auto-cut the bones uh, from CD slices. Um, and I will explain to you later why it is important. So in the big picture, you could see it's a Google picture, by the way. Uh, the big data analytics in healthcare, why it is important? Because if you go to the hospital, any, any hospital in any country, what you would like to have is almost real-time analytics. That means if a doctor sees you, he or she would like to have your patient data automatically and immediately. What is your background? What was your current uh, illness? What was your current treatment? And so on and so on. The second one goes to image analytics, where it goes into the more or less image processing world, where we try to help out the doctors what are the good and what are the bad signs we'd like to see, what we prognose that these patients could have. On the other hand, it's also important for the doctors if they could make a bad decision or a bad uh, contour on the special uh, part of the image, whether it's okay or not. So a kind of a decision input making system. And therefore also includes the pres prescriptive analysis, which means you have a prescription from the doctor, you have a prescription from another doctor, what is the correspondence between them, what can you find out, what can you leverage, what can you basically take off, and how could you um, make up an information system which helps you out. So these are the first main areas. Afterwards, you go to the predictive analytics on that, which means based on this more or less a priori um, uh, science, you can make a forecast what can happen, which means if you have some information on, on the patient and on the current treatments or the pre previous treatment, what will happen with this uh, 
guy, if he has or she has a kind of a coat, what, what did she or he had, uh, have in the last uh, year, in two years, in five years, a kind of a historical data, as well as based on the current uh, results, based on the current decision inputs, what is basically drawn down there, what we, we'll, we would like to suggest him or her as a, as a doctor to do. And at the end of the day, you could also go for scale, since we are going on with data, not only one patient is important, but a country or more countries, the EU or USA or uh, in the world, then you, you could go for like batch-like analytics on that. This is basically how it's all about. And uh, to kind of the challenges, how we, can, uh, how we can apply them and what is really important for these guys to face with is not only that we have much data to that, but second of all, how we can make it use of it, which means when it's one point you have the data, the second is what you do with it. If you think about um, uh, hands up early, uh, again, who, di who did you watch yesterday the movie uh, The Citizen for with the Snowden and the, uh, oh thank you, quite a lot. Um, or, or let's say uh, a movie about um, 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 from 2001 it was uh, um, Swordfish with uh, Hugh Jackman was a hacker. Yeah, thank you. So this film is also about that we have the data, what we do with the data. So it's one point what we can do with the data, or what we have as a data, but how we can make information about the data or how we can extract information about the, from the data. And um, there are some challenges on that and that, that will be coming. First challenge, believe or not, more than 35% of patient cases misdiagnosed uh, contributed by lacks of collaboration and access, which means if I am a patient and I go to the hospital here, probably they would like to do the best what they can, but since the data is in Hungary, uh, I'm from Hungary, so basically, basically the data is in Hungary, they couldn't reach my patient data there, so probably they could probably misleading information have uh, mistreating itself, and that is more than one third, right? So believe it or not, it's a huge number, really a huge number. And the second um, challenge we have, if you think about 2013, we had 153 exabytes of data uh, from healthcare data, and the prognosis goes for 2020 to 2,314 exabytes of uh, medicine data, which is about 50 times bigger scale. What does it mean? Uh, do you know, how many of you do you know uh, the exabyte? What is an exabyte? An exabyte is, one uh, million, one billion uh, terabytes. So it means, if, if, if just make an expression on that, how, how, how much data it is, which is basically in 2007, the whole internet base, all data, all static, dynamic, whatever data, was 173 exabytes. So it's basically comparable to the 2013 data of all medicine data, just medicine, okay? Uh, so just to, to give you another expression, five exabytes is all the words a human being ever spoken in any language in the world. So that makes some scale, how it, how it scales out. And it's also an important thing to, to measure. You could have the best storage in the world, you could have the best computers in the world, but this kind of examined or prognosed data, first of all stored and second of all computed or uh, somehow processed, which will be a really huge challenge to do. And third, the lack of system uh, interoperability. What does it mean? I have a CT scan for my patient information in 2007. Right now we have a good word, we have MRI scans. We are good people, so it's a much better detailed picture. It has a much, 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 much nicer scale, but between them there is no connection because the system, what they can interfere, what they can do the comp comparison, or what, what the systems can preprocess and make it better to understand, don't exist. And that makes 30 billion for a year, minus. So these are basically the big challenges we have on the data, only, only on the data scale we have. And then comes the next one, and therefore was the first, uh, I'm sorry, was a bit too quick. Um, um, that was the, they're coming to the next one, which is basically, okay, analyzing the images is also important, but analysis itself uh, should take care about in different ways, which means from diagnosis, 
uh, as the opposite to uh, avoid misdiagnosis, as well as uh, detecting malfunction, which means if we could be uh, in, the, in the possibilities to detect that somehow a stomach is not working or the lungs or the heart is not working properly, just to diagnose it and make it a pulse, make it an alarm real time, would help a lot in a lot of patients. Um, as, as I said earlier, uh, analytics on scale, which means you have 100 patient data, afterwards you have 1,000 patient data, you have 1 billion patient data, and you go for one, uh, uh, 10 million patient data, and so on and so on. So basically, the scale, scale on should also imply on what you're doing. And uh, as be, based on these facts, the next one is uh, a patient has allergies, uh, so-called anamnesis in Latin, which means the patient's history, based on patient's history, making prognosis on the future, has also some implication of what we can do and what we cannot do. Like somebody has uh, an allergy to some, some kind of material, of course, it's really bad for this guy to get this kind of medicine in the hospital and that kind of stuff. And of course, this comes to the treatment case history as more data we have, the more analytics we have, the more intelligent, intelligent methods we have, hopefully we also could have better results, not only for the sake for the patient, but only sake for the humanity as well. And uh, the problem of, of it uh, was uh, figured here as, as a kind of a joke here, that if, if a user uses a photo and makes a photograph somewhere in the park, how can it, I decide whether it's a park or not? And if you know a bit photographic uh, information, you know the exif is basically staying there if it, the GPS data is there, which is taken from. So it's basically about two, a few days coming from the exif metadata, setting the GPS, make an uh, inverse transformation, the GPS map, and you can say whether it's a park or not. But if you want to say you don't have metadata, you just want to go to the raw binary images, uh, how much uh, information do you need to process in the analysis? And they say, yeah, I will need probably a research team with about six people and about a year to understand what you're talking about. And why? That is the next question. Because for the images, we people understand the images pretty visually, which means we automatically connect to the objects and automatically detect the objects, how they uh, appear on the pictures. But for the computer, this, uh, this kitten's uh, mouth is about that kind of a bitery, not more, okay? So how we can analyze this and how we can apply that and, and understand it, what, what it's all about. Or um, I don't know whether you know the Russian uh, drawer. It's called Sutyev. I, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, he was a really nice uh, drawer from the Russians, and he drew... Uh, draw a uh, small book for uh, children, it's called The Three Kittens. And in The Three Kittens there is a really nice um, tale about uh, the small mouse plays with a, vo uh, with a paper and a, and a pencil. And first of all, uh, the small mouse wanted to eat the pencil. But afterwards, the pencil asked uh, the mouse, okay, please let me draw you something, whether it, it will uh, helps you or not uh, to, to understand what I'm talking about, uh, that uh, you, can, you can have a nice picture, and if you want, you can eat me afterwards. And what happens is that, uh, that the pencil tries to do, draw a picture, and based on the picture, on the left-hand side, just apple and cheese and sausages, and, and the mouse is pretty happy. But afterwards, it happened, the drawing goes over, and what happens, basically, it's just basically a cat, so basically a mouse will be uh, get feared and uh, runs out. That is basically a tale. Uh, how, what, what are the relevant information on the objects? So first of all, we try to understand in the picture. This is a bitery, but this is bitery is about a mouth of a of a cat. And the second of all, okay, this is a mouth of a cat. How this is important in the meaning of the context and the meaning of of the picture itself. And this is where deep learning comes in, because what we do with deep learning, uh, I don't know whether you. Uh, who have known anything about deep learning already? Cool, really cool, very cool. So I don't have to explain a lot. So it was really quick then. Um, you have some data, and based on this data, deep learning itself is a method of analyzing data on different layers of abstractions. And these layers of abstractions can be symbolized with the layers of the, of, of the neural network. And since they are connected uh, each other, they, they so-called D, because the information is deeply interconnected between these layers. 
And what we can do is basically the training um, in either a supervised and unsupervised mode the objects and make some categorization at the end. Or, and afterwards, we deploy the net and we test it on real objects how we can proceed. And in, that you can see on the lower side, where you can see uh, a small dog. And based on the deployment, the neural net would say it's a dog with blah, 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 uh, percentage of accuracy. All right, uh, just basically, um, that's what uh, the supervised learning is, uh, tries to estimate or try to symbolize it with another diagram. On the left-hand side, you have a linear kind of uh, estimation. You're missing in the middle point. What can you do? You basically connect two points in the neighborhood. Basically, you will, let's say, prognose the middle value based on the two ranges. But if you go to the other part and you go for the deep learning part, what will happen is it's not so simple since the model comes off with more than 4,000 input uh, parameters and uh, in, inside the hidden layers you have also more thousand interconnections, more uh, uh, more more hundred or thousands of uh, connection information in between in the hidden layers. Um, so let me abstractize uh, this kind of a problem with, with this uh, picture. Okay, um, this is the architecture probably uh, have shown yeah, uh, just before with the distributed computing. And in the middle we have deep learning, at the end you have the output. And uh, what you most know probably if you know with deep learning, that you do not know exactly what happens inside the net, since the net stores the weights and stores the information in the hidden layers. But exactly, it just basically tries to connect the trained information to the expected output information. So this is, this is the, where the miracle handles <laughs> comes in, okay? So you can try a lot of things, you can try a lot of information, try to feed in to the network, but at the end of the day, um, it's a somehow a chaotic or a somehow a randomized information you, you should have as well. And also beware, there is no free lunch. Machine learning system can be easily fooled. Why? Because if the system is trained good, that is fine, but the system has some malfunctional misleading information, then the training as we all humans do, um, it can also mislead to information. So, simple example, nowadays, self-driving cars, everybody knows it. What will happen? Self-driving cars will assume that everybody takes onto the rules on the road. And what happens if it doesn't happen? It will crash, okay? <laughs> um, the same applies in the much more simple way here. Because this picture uh, in my earlier company was identified as a face, which is of course not. But <laughs> just imagine how, it is, how dangerous it is to, to let it go without any kind of intervention. So we, we did for G Healthcare two main projects on this uh, Hades project on, on March 2016. The first one was automatically detect the regions, and therefore detect the neck and the head at the of the man, the pelvis, and the legs, or uh, arms and legs. And why it was important? Because it's a, somehow in the pre-processing phase, it's really important if you have a problem and you have a kind of a five pixel, five pixel times five pixel problem. And if it goes into your brain, or if it goes into your stomach, it's totally different. If it's in the stomach, it could be a, some kind of an air. But if it's going into your, your brain, it could be a tumor. So it's doesn't matter, it does matter where it comes from. And the second one is um, the automated bone segmentation. Uh, why bones, bone segmentation or desegmentation of bones is important? Because if you go, go for CT images, you have, for a human body, human body scan, you have about 300 like, slices. Each slice about 512 times 512 pixels. Every slice has, of course, Q, saturation and value information, because normally CTs go for this kind of uh, uh, color and information scale for the pictures. But hue values for veins, they have the, the factor, the sensitivity data for uh, showing where the veins are. It's the same kind of a hue what the bone itself has. Why is it important? Because if I would be a cardiologist, I would be really interested on what's going on inside in this heart area, but I won't be interested what is these bones about, right? So the problem is here. You have the bones and you have the veins, but inside the hue is the same, so basically there is no automatic or simple uh, <coughs> correspondence how we can deselect the bones to get the veins uh, out from the, from the body contour to get a check how it is going, whether it's ill, whether it's okay, 
and so on. So that was the second one. And why it isn't also be important? Because we would like to pre-process the phases. As the first one is really important to also for diagnosis, like say pre-selecting the slices, whether it's okay or not. The second one is also important, almost fully automatically deselect the things which we do not need, since the information is too much. And these both stories are really important. Why? Because normal case of radiologists just diagnosing the picture for every single patient needs about 10 to 20 minutes. And with this kind of automation, we can decrease the time about one to two minutes. So it, in this case, we can, first of all, save the lives of the radiologists. They, they can do their work and probably make less errors because since they will be not so tired. And the second one is, with using only, only machine learning and computer power possibilities, we can also increase our possibilities going with scale and machine learning. Okay, um, where it's OS old or new school, probably those of you who learned deep learning, it's not, not a new slide, it's basically pretty, uh, let's say, general for, for understanding it. Um, the manual design features are often well crafted, but they need extra knowledge. What I, what I mean about it? Uh, we had an, um, an algorithm which basically makes a 3D snake, whether you know image processing, you'll know. It's basically a 3D terrain, and you go with a, a so-called snake, which snake has to find the lowest place in the, in the territory. And the problem is it is a really, really uh, complicated one. It was about uh, 10 people for about two years' time to develop this kind of software. With the deep learning, hopefully it will be reduced the development time and at the same time increasing the, the precision or the accuracy of the, of, the, of the levels. Why is it important? As the same way as, as I already talked, to save the radiologist time and as well reduce error rate. Okay. What we did, what we did for tools. Um, um, those of you who know um, deep learning, probably Coffee is a well known one. It's a really good one, uh, tool set from. Uh, at Berkeley. We used uh, CUD on NVIDIA and OpenCL for AMD, uh, AMD uh, to be compared with uh, both uh, providers. They are both really, really cool providers and really good chip uh, factories. We use Digis as a, as a, as a front end or as an interface uh, uh, for uh, CAFE. Uh, on the other hand, we use for OpenCL R and HDO. HDO. Uh, we also extended some knowledge on MATLAB and Python scripts on, on the existing ones. And we used on these two uh, reference hardware architecture to be comparable on, on the hardware sizes as well. Um, so, the first project, applying deep learning. As I said earlier, uh, I'd like to go to, into more, a bit more detail. To facilitate the background processing more, to pre-select the slices I need. And afterwards, I, therefore, I enabled the region-specific analysis and improve the detection of the anatomy structures uh, because every single people has, believe it or not, it's a unique. Every, every human being is a unique. There is no such a thing like an optimal body, like a 3D model. There's no such thing. Everybody has some differences. There is nothing that the two lungs are the same size, the, the heart is the same size for everybody, and so on and so on. These kind of things can be automated, of course, but uh, to be fault around, to be uh, tolerant to uh, size changes, we have to apply our existing knowledge for that. And if you apply the, uh, the algorithms, that kind of randomness I talked about earlier should be applied into the current or the future designs as well. And in order to ex um, improve ex existing applications or create new one, which means, first of all, we have this kind of lack of inter interoperability. So we, you have a CT scan, and if you go to the doctor and shows the CT scan really nice, why don't you have it, it in digital form? But the point is, because my PC or my Mac or whatever cannot apply the DICOM or the picture itself, which will be sent by the, by the hospital. So the problem here is also lack of interoperability. And based on these new models, we try to int introduce new ways of understanding how the pictures can be transmitted or uh, cooperated all over the world. And um, okay, to the region detection, we had here uh, the earlier algorithms on the on the top side, on the upper side. The deep learning is on the down downside. That, that doesn't need too much explanation. The first part is you have input data of medical images. 
you have algorithm for classification, which is a uh, normal case done, done with SVMs, multi classifications, and random forest. Afterwards, you go for the data alignment, where you have too high or too low data, you have to align them, you have to confirm them to make the same kind of consolidated data again, to make a post-processing phase again on the top, and afterwards you can have the output, which is the region, which is the correct part, whether this part has a region, inside has a lung, and whether this lung is okay, and so on. On the top bottom, just basically apply deep learning with too many, uh, some training data, and we have seen what happens. Um, just to make a simple example on that, you have here a, pal, um, a chest base slice, and you make a kind of a, a simple net similar to AlexNet if, you, if somebody knows the deep learning models. Uh, and you can see how it works in the model phases. You have the pooling, the convolutional layers, the pooling layers after each other, and you can make it also the, re the reduction, on, you could see also the reduction of the classification parts on the right hand side if you go forward or toward the doors. And then you could see how much accuracy we could achieve. Well, actually, it was a pretty good slice, so we could achieve really good results, but it can happen that it will be less accurate. OK, um, and what we did here, we trained the data with about uh, 23,000 uh, training data for different patients. And afterwards, about eight, uh, 72 patients. And afterwards, we tested them with different set of uh, patient data where we cannot uh, have uh, Access and then we, just, uh, we, we tested against uh, cross validation with about uh, 90 patients uh, for about uh, two times 6,000 slices, which is about 20-22%. Uh, and uh, what we also did for the model, uh, we tried to be more fault tolerance in the meaning that you are basically lying in the city, right? So basically just having here and you have here the city where it goes and just basically goes to the table and comes back. Okay, but what if somebody cannot cannot uh, cannot lay? So, you say, say a little bit, little bit low, a little bit higher, or legs are not there, or whatever. So, therefore, what we did is basically make a kind of a um, transformation and a rotation on five and ten percent on the left and five and ten percent on the right, to avoid a miscalculation and to be more fault tolerant on the patient sizes, patient ages, and so on. Just imagine the following sample. You have the 80-year-old, and you have uh, a 30-year-old, which is uh, who has uh, a smaller uh, uh, size of a body. Both people are uh, probably healthy and has no problem, but both bodies have totally different structures. Why? Because the children themselves, as we grow, the head becomes smaller uh, compared to the body. And uh, the body itself becomes bigger. So the 30-year-old's body segment will be smaller compared to the child's head. But it's just normal. But you have to take care about it, OK? So that kind of stuff is also interesting to know. And on the right-hand side, you could see also the statistics, how it works. Um, from the start, it was pretty cool, because uh, we were astonished that if we train uh, the data with good anatomy detected regions by the doctors, which means it was a supervised learning. Uh, then we had really good results from the start on, but unfortunately what we uh, haven't uh, accumulated to that is basically the computational, computational time. Since we had used GPU-based processing and we had pretty good computers, unfortunately it took, it took also days, almost a week, to train a full model with full data. So you can imagine how the scalability part, when I was talking about earlier in the, in the speech, um, how it can comes from when we, when we try to apply them for really millions of people. So that, that should be taken care of. And the second one is uh, turning down the lower, uh, the learning rates uh, error rate, which is basically the, the red there, the red uh, line there. Which is, shows how the error rate fell down, and it was really impressive, but we have to be taken care of whether we retrain a model does retrain shouldn't go up as well, to be yeah, cautious about what we do with the data. And, uh, and this is what we did. And you can have some results on the performance as well. The GPU is about, uh, for 270 million milliseconds, go with the full uh, scan of the body, which means about 300 slices for one man. And with the CPU-based image, it was 2.2 two, 2 seconds goes for the same way. So it's about nine times performant for go with GPUs. <coughs> of course, I have to also tell you, 
is not always the best way because if you go for cloud or if you go for any other computing environment where the GPU cannot be affordable or the hospitals cannot have it whatsoever, you have to be really careful what you are planning on because the hardware is describing, describing uh, your abilities, abilities, what you can do with it. You can also see um, how we can reach the precisions. There was a, a mean here, you can see as well. It was pretty cool. And um, on the right hand side, you could also see how the regions were uh, detected and uh, went forward. Okay, the second project, Project Bones. So, uh, as I told you about earlier, we have to mask out the bones. Why it is important to, because we would like to see the veins, we would won't like to see the bones there. there. And we would like to have fully automated part of that. This is, this is basically the problem we are talking about. If you could see, the hue values of these guys is the same from the computation point of view. As we mankind or we human beings, we can distinguish them. But if you think about the, the cat in, uh, in the start of the speech, it's really hard for the computer to understand, OK, this is not a bone. Uh, why it's not a bone? It's, it has the same uh, hue, saturation, and value, what I had earlier. Why it's not a bone? So we had to find out how we can train the model that it can, it can react whether it's a bone or not a bone. So what we did for that? Uh, as far as you know, uh, all medical images from the body is not a two-dimensional thing, but a three-dimensional thing. But instead of uh, just doing two-dimensional analysis on images, we we decided to do three-dimensional uh, analysis on the images, and we made small patches on the images around. And that means, first of all, more complexity on the algorithms, but second of all, it tries to go to the three-dimensional space, tries to, uh, tries to um, leverage that we have three dimension in the CT images, although, uh, unfortunately, not every single uh, aspect is known by us. So uh, what is shown there, is basically we have the slice and we made the patches. Uh, every patch was three, uh, 35 times 30 time, 31 uh, pixel size. And we did all for the vertical slicing and for horizontal slices, we did 15 times 50 slices. So basically we made pictures from the patients like this. And from that, 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 that slices we take 15 times 15 small patches to decide this is a bone, this is not a bone, this is and so on. And we did also that kind of stuff with this is a bone, this is not a bone, patches. And, and here it has goes. Uh, the vessels are recognized correctly, but unfortunately, um, these, these were the, the uh, I'm sorry, uh, I had here talked about it that we had to go for the 3D, why? Because the 2D information was not enough, right? So we had to go for the 2.5D, why 2.5D? Because it's not a full 3D information, but we had to extend this kind of horizontal and vertical information together. So if you, if you see this, uh, it's also not only selecting the correct vessels, but also selecting not the part of the body, which means in this case the, the bed we are lying on, on the, low, on the lower end, um, which also can be distracted from the image. Therefore, it can be also better for the doctors, because in this case they don't have to care about the other parts of the image, which could be disruptive, okay? So, and um, that's what we did. We did the uh, patch creation, and afterwards this kind of uh, uh, two different models were put together, combined together, and therefore made the output. And uh, as I said earlier, the 3D slices were 31 times 31 pixels, and the 3D, uh, 2.5D slices were 15 times 15 uh, base pixel sizes. So, okay, now comes a question. The question for, this, for the sake of equality. On the left-hand side and the right-hand side, there is a male and a female. Uh, heads up, uh, who do you think a man is on the left-hand side? Wow, <laughs> yeah, pretty impressive. And uh, I guess basically it's true, and you can try it out. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's a, there's a lady. Why? Uh, not only because of the lower areas of the bed, of the, of the pictures, but on the upper side, you could see there's a higher musculature here, and the lady, they have, they have a, a higher musculature here. Why? Because it's important to giving the birth to the child. So, 
So that is that is going to give. If you go, if you couldn't see the lower parts, you can also easily under, understand based on the upper parts. Um, okay, and uh, as a conclusion, what what did it uh, came? What did it come as as a conclusion for us? And uh, first of all, we could leverage deep learning as a powerful uh, method, not only for image analysis but also for text processing, uh, voice processing. Um, classification of the images. Uh, second of all, similar models can be applied pretty quickly. We based our bone model based on the model what we had for the detection. The only thing we changed is basically we, we did for the patches approach instead of full scan approaches. And, uh, and applicable for a wide area, area of applications and there is no need for handcrafted features. Why it is important? In normal case you are, we are living in a speedy world, right? And if you are speaking in a speedy world, you don't have the time for that. It's really important because it's about lives, but to improve this kind of processes is really, really difficult to do. It really takes a long, long time, takes long, long efforts, and a lot of, to do, a lot of people have to do it. And uh, just to show you uh, how it worked in the real life, the reference classification algorithm compared to the deep learning one. If you could see there was a 93% uh, from the original application, and we did it with 97.2% uh, accuracy on the application. On the lower head, we had a, a post-processing phase, which means we try to uh, figure out what could be an error, what could be not an error, and then we try to pre-process the data more with a kind of pre-processed after post-processing phase, which means to try out which are the slices not correspond to the regions we have. That's a so-called big confusion. It's like you have here the head and you have here the chest and you identify the slice between the head and the chest as a pelvis, which is not correct. That kind of stuff. And after the post-processing phase, it was reduced by zero, only by classical algorithms. But the same way, without classical algorithms, went well, pretty well on the deep learning part. And that was pretty impressive because that was about one week's work for three people. The first segment was about, as I said, about 10 people for a half a year. So, uh, and uh, actually, th these are the benefits we could use, and uh, th these are the information we could also leverage. So, all very welcome to connect me on LinkedIn and, and so. And uh, um, uh, thank you for the time. And do you have any questions? Yes, please. I noticed you used both CUDA and OpenCL. Yeah. Uh, can you comment? Uh, did you spot any differences, uh, significant, uh, uh, significant difference in, in performance or or the time it, 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 it was needed to solve the problem in one right. yeah, either one way or another? Right. Way. Uh, we we did use Cafe, and there is the AMD bridge for Cafe as well. But we uh, decided to go for NVIDIA for that because it was easier for us to set up the system. But afterwards, we did for AMD uh, a kind of a research how we can leverage their knowledge on the OpenCL part. It's uh, from the performance point of view, from the timing point of view, it's a bit slower. But from the uh, accuracy point of view, both uh, graphical chipsets are pretty cool. So, uh, in my personal opinion, if you don't have the time, go for NVIDIA because you have more support from the libraries and uh, it's much more spread. But uh, AMD probably uh, catching on on the OpenCL part. So probably OpenCL can help this kind of problems to be solved. And as, as far as I know, uh, there's also a kind of an, an extension doing on mobiles with OpenCL extension, OpenGL extensions on Android and uh, iOS devices. So probably if you go for mobile-based devices, probably OpenCL would be more portable in the meaning. If you go for uh, desktop-based or server-based, probably, or cloud-based, then probably NVIDIA would be uh, kind of a choice. But both of them are really cool, so I would recommend both, but depending on, on your purpose. Please. So, uh, you mentioned that the, the problems that you are solving are, are very computing-intensive in the segmentation part, which told us that it was just 24 hours just training the model. How, right. how could you... Uh, Ambition that it can make, make accessible to the everyday doctor to, to really have them on the field. 
Question is good. Uh, the point is here between the training and the running or testing or deployment. If you train a net, you basically train a net how, what is good and what is bad. What is category A, category B, and so on. And afterwards, the model itself will be deployed to the doctor's machine, to the CT scanner, whatever. And afterwards, it will be it will be used as a runtime. It will be not used as a training system. It can be retrained, of course, but it will be used as a runtime system. And and you're right. Um, if you're mentioning the time scale, um, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Try to find it. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I think the the main difference was that. Uh, uh, yeah, for the for the for the quickness of, of testing the images, it basically two and a half, two point two seconds for the whole body. So basically, compared to the normal day, everyday life, where the doctors have to, from the packs, I don't know whether you know the frame uh, or the word, packs is a as a kind of a client machine for the hospitals to upload the pictures to the service. So connect to the packs and see the images cost them about five to ten minutes compared to 2.2 uh, seconds to have the information already pre-selected for them, it's, uh, I think it's pretty good value. But you're right, it is a difference. If you want to retrain it, it will take more time. Also, not to forget, uh, it's also kind of an informational uh, gap between the doctors. So probably if you go to the detection, um, some doctors, whether it was anatomically said, what is the region, they themselves misleading us with the definition. Sometimes it was just like at the border of my shoulder, sometimes at the, at the fifth of my uh, bones here, but they, they themselves were not so accurate as they were waiting. So it's also kind of a challenge we have to face with. Any more questions? Please. Uh, do you think um, crunching more, than, like more data during training will help the accuracy? Or, or you have some other ideas for improving the After after a definite number of uh, training data, it is not possible to be more precise. That's for that's for sure. So let's say about two hundred thousand images should be enough, and two hundred ten or two hundred fifty thousand images won't be uh, uh, won't take you any more advantages on that. On the other hand. Uh, somehow a post-processing part should be developed somewhere better, which means deep learning would be, let's say, one part, and afterwards the rest, the 2.8% error rate, should be somehow minimized with, with uh, clever algorithms which goes on these pre-selected parts to be more accurate on that. So, answer to your question, it, within one scale, uh, within a large scale of numbers, till a, a definite point, it will be better. But if, as you saw the, um, the diagram where it was, goes with the learning rate and so is also a so-called curse of dimensionality in the, in the deep learning world. Where you could say, oh, it doesn't matter how big you, you can do with the learning, afterwards it will, it will fall down with the accuracy. Because that will be overfit or overtook the, the, the precision rate. So the overfit problem, did you do any drop -offs? Um, for this method, uh, fortunately we didn't need it, but for the bones method we, we, we have to find out new ways for the robots, yes. Okay guys, thank you very much.